Okay, so we're coming to the last part of this chapter when we come to the Emperor Diocletian. And even if you think about his name, it just sounds bad. So you're just to situate ourselves, we're in the year 303. And um, he reigned from 303 to 313. So just to give you an idea, the empire is um, undergoing many, many military and political uh, disruptions. Okay, the, the empire is enormous. And Diocletian realizes after the defeat of his predecessor Valerian, Remember, Valerian was captured by the Persians in 260. And um, after Valerian's uh, capture, the church had a considerable amount of peace, and there weren't so many martyrs, or at least they were only little um, groups of martyrs instead of huge numbers. Um, many of the bishops were given back their property, um, from the state, and also um, Christians themselves received their property back if they were still living. Now, Diocletian took the throne in 284, and there's a lot going on on both sides of the empire. So remember, Rome is always trying to expand and extend their, their reign, and on the, on the west, they're meeting with many um, what we would consider now German tribes, but we're talking about like vicious barbarians, okay? Um, and then on the other side, on the east, we have the Persians and Arabs that are coming up from the Arabian Peninsula, and they're both battling with Diocletian's armies on both fronts. So the, um, the empire is weakening because of their divided strength and the only having one central leader, Diocletian feels himself in, incapable of governing well. So he gets this brilliant idea to divide the empire into four main parts that would be governed by two Caesars, which are the head honcho. So we're talking about like two presidents and then to vice presidents, which would be the Augustus, okay? Um, and so, sorry, excuse me, au revés. Here we go, let's do this again. It, forget what I said about the Caesars. Um, we have Diocletian and Maximian as the head honchos as the Augustus. And then we have Constantius as like Maximian's understudy, and then Galerius, um, as the understudy of Diocletian. And so we have here a map of the division. And so you can read the, you can read the legend there up in the right corner of how the kingdom or the empire was divided. But I want to note here is that the Germanic peoples are being attacked because Rome wants to extend their kingdom or empire up north and also over here the um the persians are being fought off on this side and so if i'm going to let the little slide thing disappear but you see where my mouse is that's the holy land okay the holy land uh, where jesus lived no and uh, Bethlehem, you see on the map, Palestine. Over there is the Arabian Peninsula if you go further south. And so it's good to um, situate ourselves and understand why the empire begins to crumble after Diocletian um, makes this decision to divide it. Okay. And so, of course, there's now four guys instead of one guy in charge of of the empire. And so there's going to be lots of differing opinions and other things like that. And so we're going to see how Diocletian himself becomes a persecutor of Christians. Um, this is a, a statue of the four leaders. So um, the tetrarchy is what it's called, the distribution 
of power between four rulers to govern the four quarters of the empire. Now, Diocletian issues four edicts. And edicts are like proclamations, right? And so one of the main influences is his sidekick or vice president or however you want to call him, Galerius. And Galerius would be the next Augustus of the Western Empire or the Eastern Empire. So this is a scary, um, scary thought. Galerius hated Christians and he wanted to exterminate them altogether. Diocletian, on the other hand, was, I mean, he didn't really care. He, um, he was pretty tolerant by his nature, but Galerius convinced him that if he was friendly towards the Christians, that the emperor would sure, the empire would surely disappear and dissolve. Um, and so little by little, they issued edicts. The first edict, as you see on the screen, is that um, they terminated all civil rights for Christians and destroyed Christian churches, sacred vessels, and sacred scriptures. Okay, so that was the first step. Um, destroy the civil rights that were due to them as Roman citizens, destroy their churches, their sacred vessels, and sacred scripture. The important word here is sacred because they're taking away the identity of the Christians, or so they think. They think that if they take away the church, the building, or the chalices, or the books of the scriptures, that our faith will be totally destroyed, but that's not the case. So then they move on to um, to the second edict where they called for the imprisonment of clergy, and then the the next step was the torture and death of these clergy members and lastly they in the fourth edict they declared that um all christians were liable to being arrested and tortured if they did not um did not give their allegiance to rome and so this is very important because these four edicts attack centrally those who took the place of christ after his death and resurrection and just like jesus says if you strike the shepherd the sheep will scatter and so the romans knew this that if you take out their leader then the people will be afraid but they had never met anything quite like a christian and so during the persecution of diocletian and galerian um we see that there are many um many cruel torments they send people to the mines um they send people to the front lines of the of battle. Um, and so that's one Im interesting thing. But then um, after many battles, um, Diocletian gets very sick and he steps down from the throne and Galerius takes, um, takes over, but he moves back to Rome. He also gets sick and um, the persecutions kind of wane down uh, a little bit here. And so um, we see that um, there's a very important battle that happens um, between Constantia or Con the son of Constantius, Constantine, the great who we know well, um, or you're going to get to know him well. Um, and there is a very important battle that goes on at a place called Milvian Bridge. And um, in at that site, Constantine, who is not a Christian, sees in the sky the symbol of Christ, and he hears in hoc signo vincis, and which is translated, in this sign you will conquer. And so here's a famous painting of that moment. I blew up the, the sign of the cross, obviously, on the left side, but you see that there's an emperor here, or Constantine here with his troops, but then he sees in the sky this image of the cross being held by angels while he's preparing for battles. battle. And so he has all of the soldiers paint on their shields the same symbol that they see in the sky, and he um, he goes and attacks Maxentius, and um, and they win the battle. 
and they agree to concede the entire empire to Constantine following that. And so here I have, uh, obviously this is the beginning of faith for Constantine because he will later become a Christian. His mother is, is also a canonized saint, Saint Helena, who found the true cross. And so we see that this miraculous sign in the sky was a moment to end the persecutions and also um, to um, to begin the seed of faith, plant the seed of faith in Constantine. So here you'll see the video that I've embedded so you can kind of get an idea of what happens in that in that battle.